Good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today for the second OC Law Group event of this year. Um, I'm Ashe. I'm a second year law um, student at the University of York. I joined Highgate in the sixth form where I was in schoolhouse and left about two about years ago years in 2019. Some of my interests and experience in law. So this year I've been working with a law firm, representing them at my university as a brand ambassador. I'm also currently on my Law Society's committee as a sports secretary. And whilst at Highgate, I was highly involved in um, the music department and have sort of carried this interest in music through to university as well. So, um, and I'm looking to do my dissertation on the effect of copyright laws on the creativity in the music industry. So that's a bit about me. I'll now pass it over to Jack. Hello everyone. Um, thanks, Asse. Uh, yeah, I graduated from Highgate in 2004. Uh, I was in Southgate. Um, and yeah, my interests, uh, I was always a keen sportsman, represented Highgate in athletics and uh, football. Uh, which I then did at university where I studied um, law at Cardiff. Um, and I'm currently um, a partner at a media and law firm in Soho called Sheridan's. Um, in terms of my practice, uh, it, it kind of straddles two sectors. Um, I do a lot of sports and I sit in the sports team uh, and I represent um, some of the sort of main governing bodies in motorsport. And I also... Um, do games. Uh, I started off as a games lawyer and um, that's video games by the way uh, and I do some social media and advertising. Um, um, so that's me um, and in terms of the audience today uh, I can see that we have uh, many OCs which is great um, and we also have many members of the Highgate Pupil Boys um, body and girls as well as students from our partner schools many of whom are here because they're interested in a career in law. Um, over to you, uh, Kira. Thanks for that, um, Ashe and Jack. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Kieran Jay. Um, I am a former pupil of Highgate School a very long time ago now. I think I left in 1990. Uh, I'm currently um, a partner at the media and entertainment firm Harbottle & Lewis, where I'm uh, head of the music team. Um, uh, Harbottle & Lewis is a... Um, medium or rather large medium sized uh, uh, media and entertainment practice in the West End that also specializes in um, uh, private client and uh, reputation management. Uh, I've been there since January 2020. Um, my um, role uh, is as a commercial lawyer. So I'm a lawyer who negotiates um, contracts uh, on behalf of my clients. My client base is predominantly uh, artists and talent um, in the music industry, but also um, uh, models, uh, actresses, actors, uh, writers, etc. So it's a very sort of individual talent uh, based practice. Uh, and in the last few years, um, I've been spreading out and representing um, a lot of uh, executives uh, in the media and entertainment industry, in particular in the music industry. Um, in relation to their sort of entrepreneurial activities. So sort of uh, spreading my wings into uh, corporate uh, deals, joint ventures and um, M&A work as well. So um, um, that's what I do currently. Um, I've been asked to sort of give a brief history of my uh, time at Highgate um, and then my path to uh, path through my career, which I'll do. Um, I'll try not to bore you too much, but um, uh, and uh, Asha and Jack, at any point, if you feel I'm going on too much, uh, please intervene. Um, uh, I joined Highgate uh, in Chumley um, in the sort of early 80s. Um, it was quite a, a change for me. I joined from a local state school. Um, there was um, a big cultural shift for, uh, from a state school to a, to a sort of very well-established uh, private school. Um, but it was uh, an amazing change for me. There were loads of... Um, opportunities um, and uh, huge uh, facilities and, and, and loads of choice of activities um, in, uh, in the school. Um, I've tried to make the most of them, uh, predominantly in sport. Um, I think I tried my hand at literally every sport that uh, Highgate had to offer. Uh, I succeeded at some. Um, I failed at lots of others, uh, in particular gymnastics and swimming, which we weren't uh, 
won't dwell on. Um, but I played a lot of football. Um, I, I managed to captain um, uh, the uh, the school at most at most age, age levels um, through school. Um, so I suppose football was my predominant sport. Um, yes, um, after leaving the school after after sixth form after getting my a levels i went to bristol university and where i read law um i'm very interested to uh, discuss whether other people who've read law enjoy enjoying it or enjoyed it i have to say i found it very dull um and thought very hard about uh, changing and, and and thinking of a an alternative career path um, but i stuck with it um got through my law degree at bristol um and did a uh, the first lpc course at the guildford college of law which was actually a game changer for me. Um, the LPC course um, was a new course uh, that they'd introduced, uh, the Law Society had introduced, and it was much more practical in its approach um, and focus. And actually um, a lot of the, um, the studying was actually uh, in the role playing of the um, role as a solicitor or barrister. Uh, so I, I appreciated that a lot more. Um, I managed to get through Guildford. Um, I got a training contract at a mid-sized um, city firm called Nicholson, Graham and Jones, now a big American firm called k &L Gates. Um, I trained there for two years and I qualified into the corporate team um, and the corporate team at Nicholson, Graham and Jones had a very particular media and sports leaning, which was, um, which was interesting. Um, but uh, I didn't last very long in the city. Um, it wasn't really the culture for me. Um, I didn't really appreciate working in very big teams for very big corporate clients where they felt where, where you felt very detached from the um, from the people involved in the transactions. Um, and uh, it felt a bit uh, bit soulless to me. So I took a huge step um, and uh, and jumped out of the city and joined uh, a two partner practice in the media and uh, music industry called Babington and Bray. Uh, which is now now a firm called Bray and Crow, very successful niche media and music firm, um, and it was a huge um, leap. Uh, everyone said I was crazy. Uh, most of my family thought I was mad. Most of my uh, former employers thought I was crazy. But um, but it actually it, um, was a game changer again because um, um, I went from working in very large teams uh, in a very impersonal uh, environment, um, seemingly to um, a very intimate and personal. Um, practice where literally uh, you had day-to-day -day, uh, interaction with the clients, whether they were artists, musicians, producers, songwriters, and also their managers. And, um, and you really were at the coalface um, and it was real cut and thrust stuff. So it was very exciting, very stressful, um, uh, not so well paid, um, but I thought that that was um, something that um, I could uh, change over time. And um, after about eight years, at Bray and Cray as it then became. Um, I was made a partner. Um, I developed a practice of my own. Uh, I had clients like um, Artful Dodger, for anyone out there who likes Garage. Um, Girls Aloud, for anyone who likes Pop. Um, and um, various artists in between. And then in about um, December 2005, I got a phone call from um, my uncle, who was um, a, a, also a solicitor. Um, a very successful solicitor who uh, worked in the city, but also dabbled in sport. His name was uh, Michael Kennedy. He was famously Roy Keane's uh, lawyer, also Alex Ferguson, Kevin Keegan. And he called me up um, just before Christmas and said that he had a great opportunity for me. Um, he'd taken on um, as clients um, a young player who just moved to Man United called Wayne Rooney and his very, um, uh, um, and his very talented wife, uh, Colleen, who was uh, also forging a very important, uh, very significant career in social media. Um, and he asked me if I wanted to take them on as clients. Um, I immediately said that would be fantastic. And I was very happy to go and tell my, par my partners at Bray and Cray that I was bringing in the Roonies as clients, at which point my uncle very quickly um, um, appraised me of the fact that he wouldn't be gifting me such stellar clients for me to take into a, a rival firm. And that there was a condition of me getting the work, which was that I had to come and join him at his firm. So once again, um, in a sort of very sort of opportunistic way, I decided um, maybe I should um, try something new. Um, and I jumped out of Brain Cray um, and went to work with my uncle at his firm and spent a very um, exciting, uh, but I would say very challenging four and a half years working 
um, in the um, sport uh, in the sports world, uh, both professional uh, football, in particular Premiership footballers, um, and also um, I took some of my music practice with me as well. So I sort of combined um, music and sport. Um, I say it was a, a roller coaster ride. Um, working in football is not easy. Um, it's a very uh, tricky and uh, very uh, nefarious business, um, as I'm sure everyone uh, has read from the back pages and also the front pages of various newspapers. Um, but it was um, very exciting. Um, the work was of a very high end. I think the first piece of work I was given on starting at the firm was probably, um, I think it goes down in history as the biggest uh, book deal ever done with a sporting personality in history. Um, it was a, um, a, a very significant deal. I, I was asked if I'd ever done a book deal before and I answered, yes, I've done a number of book deals for the likes of Westlife, Girls Aloud. Um, but I hadn't quite done a book deal on the scale of the one that I was presented with. So it was very much a baptism of fire and I was learning very quickly. Um, so I did that for about four and a half years. Um, my uncle decided that he was going to wind things up at the end of his career. Um, he asked me whether I'd like to inherit his practice. Um, I felt that uh, at that stage of my life with uh, two, uh, two young kids that um, taking on a practice as a sole practitioner partner was um, uh, probably a challenge too, too much for me. And I was approached by Leon Thompson, um, another very reputable firm in media and entertainment. Um, um, who asked me to come along um, and join them uh, in their music team um, and to do a bit of sports work as well. I joined them in 2011 um, and had um, a very successful eight or nine years working there um, and a very happy time working there before um, Harbottle and Lewis offered me the job of head of music um, at Harbottle. Um, over that time, um, I've worked with uh, various uh, talented artists, uh, and sports people. Um, this is the point I think where we have to name drop a bit, but um, I um, have worked with everyone from the Roonies, obviously, um, uh, the likes of uh, Mr. Keane, um, who is a very interesting client to, uh, to, to try and manage, um, and um, uh, Lily Allen, uh, Jess Glynn, uh, FK Twigs, Little Sims, um, so various, various, uh, very talented um, artists, writers, producers, um, who I've been very lucky to um, to work for. That's it. I hope that's sufficient. And um, very interested in any questions anyone's got. Uh, thank you, Kieran, for um, that excellent account. Um, it sounds like you've had a, a very successful um, years in the industry. Um, in, in terms of housekeeping, I, I just want to mention that obviously we'll, we'll do a, a QA. and a um, So if you have any questions for Kieran or Asse or myself, um, please feel free to put them in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen and um, we'll answer as many uh, as, as we can. Um, Kieran, you mentioned Wayne Rooney and other sp uh, sporting personalities. Um, first question I have for you is really, did your interest in sport lead to that particular aspect of law or was it by coincidence? Um, did it have an impact? Um, I think, Jack, it was, it, uh, I, my involvement in sports law has been a, a, a number of happy coincidences, really. When I joined Nicholson, Graham and Jones, I didn't um, really know much about the um, uh, corporate work that they did, but they happened to just work in, uh, they had a number of partners who were very keen to uh, develop their practices in sports. So um, I was involved in some very interesting corporate transactions as a trainee, um, including the sort of purchase of um, Wasps Rugby Club by... Um, uh, Chris Wright, who owned Christmas Group, um, we acted for the, the rugby club, we acted for Wasps in that instance, which was a um, very interesting deal to be done. Um, and, and then um, I deliberately um, decided to go into music when I left the city, because I think sport and music are the two big passions in my life. Um, I've had a number of family members who've worked in the music industry, including another uncle very successfully as a music lawyer. Um, and my mother worked in the music industry as well um, in, in her career. So I decided to go for music over sport. Um, and then I was very lucky to have received that phone call from my uncle um, several years later um, with the opportunity to go back, you know, to go back and do, do sport work. So not deliberately, um, just by just by happy chance, really. Thanks, Karen. Um, you said that music and sport were two of 
um, your passions in life. So I was, my question is just, um, was it, was sport very important to you at school as well? Uh, I'd say sport pretty much dominated my life while at Highgate. I, 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 I would say that I probably paid sport on five or six days of the week while a student at uh, Highgate because I was pretty much game for anything. Um, as I say, I, I joined the school. I was a pretty proficient footballer. I, I, I was playing sort of quite a high standard of football before I joined the school. Um, but then suddenly I was introduced to fives and tennis and squash and cricket. Um, as I say, a couple of other sports that I didn't do particularly well in, which were gymnastics and swimming. Um, uh, but um, I was pretty much game for anything. So I played, yeah, I played sport a lot. And I, I, I think, you know, when you were, you were training on a Monday evening and you were playing a, another school on a Wednesday and a Saturday, and I was also playing Sunday football and, um, and also training with, uh, with other teams. Um, yeah, sport pretty much dominated my, uh, my, my. Kieran, you mentioned as part of your role is um, obviously representing talent uh, and artists and obviously their image rights. Um, I get, f my question for really f is, is, can you enlighten us on what that entails on a day-to-day -day basis so that the audience can get a feel of, of, of how you represent those artists and how you commercialize their rights? Sure. Um, first, first and foremost, I suppose my role is as um, the talent lawyer. So my job is to um, review and negotiate contracts that they are going to be entering into for uh, the provision of their services on a, for promotional purposes and also the grant of their, their IP or their brand, um, uh, which is the, their reputation and their, their goodwill in the marketplace and, and obviously um, their likeness, uh, their image. Um, and um, so that's, that's my role. The, the, the sort of procurement of the work tends to be done by a manager or an agent. Uh, we work very closely um, with, with the managers and agents who are out there securing those opportunities for the talent. And depending on the relationship with the agent or the manager, we can be very sort of frontline in getting involved in those negotiations at the very outset of the interest from the brand or the, the commercial organization or sometimes we can be much more back room and we can be um, have a sort of more secondary role, which is more dealing with the paperwork as and when the deal has been negotiated. Personally, I'm very uh, keen to be as involved at the front uh, and on the front line as, as possible, because I think um, there's, you know, there's huge value that the lawyer can add very early in the negotiating process. And there's lots of uh, um, uh, uh, lots of strategy and, and lots of sort of um, uh, added value uh, that can be given at that point. Um, we are engaged to, you know, ensure that there is a very good balance in the deal between obviously the money that the artist or the talent are securing for their services, uh, but also um, the, um, the rights and the services that the artist are, are giving up um, so that there isn't um, a situation where you know, the artist is uh, underselling those rights or um, over, you know, being uh, asked to over deliver on services. So it's, it's a balancing exercise between, the, you know, the money and the opportunity and also the rights and the services that are given. Um, I was wondering, are there, what are the challenges in your job and are there any specific cases that you can sort of think of that have been particularly challenging, for example, with social media or maybe misuse of branding, that sort of thing? Um, social media is a bit of a bugbear for me personally. Um, I'm, uh, as my children will tell you, I'm very tech averse. I'm a bit of a Luddite. Um, uh, I think social media is a very dangerous tool. It's a fantastic shop front um, and it's an incredible um, connector uh, of people, but uh, by the same um, um, uh, token, it's, it's, it's quite a risky environment. Um, we have, um, uh, we do an enormous amount of educational work with our clients uh, around the use of social media, um, when to use it, how to use it. Um, we do things like uh, digital audits for our clients where we go, when we take on a new client, we will go through their social media and we will audit it for them to ensure that there are not things that they've posted historically that might cause them problems down the line. Um, if there are how to manage those things, how to um, you know how to deal with them, the repercussions of those things. So, uh, yes, uh, I'd say um, social media 
um, poses significant risks for, for our clients, as well as great opportunities, um, as long as it's, it's well managed. Um, sort of on the point of um, working with your clients, it must be quite exciting. And I bet you meet loads of interesting people and attend exciting events. Could you tell us a bit about some of the interesting people, events that you've been invited to through your work? Uh, yeah, I'd say that the reason um, I get out of bed in the morning is because of the people that I work with, uh, certainly the artists and, and some of the managers uh, are, you know, very interesting people, highly driven, hugely talented, uh, very eccentric, um, you know, no, no one artist, client or manager are, are the same, they're all very different um, and they all demand very sort of bespoke services, so it's quite a challenging job to be working with quite uh, temperamental people you know there's there's uh, there's a lot of divas um in the in the space that um that i work in uh, but that makes it uh, challenging but fun at the same time um yes the events are you know also a big part of it whether it's um whether it's going to the brits and seeing a client win a brit award or um you know seeing them headline uh, the o2 for the first time um those are very special moments i'd say probably my peak moment um, uh, in my career after about 22 years in, in and out of music was probably Stormzy headlining Glastonbury in 2019. I think it was um, an, a major, major cultural event for this country, um, major cultural, you know, major event for him um, to see a guy who's come from um, Croydon to, uh, you know, leading, leading um, his, 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 his lane in music, but also then headlining on uh, on the back of one successful album, um, a phenomenal achievement. And I think standing side of stage and witnessing that and the quality of the performance that he put on, um, plus the inclusive nature of it, I think, you know, he, I think he, he name checked 47 grime MCs um, throughout the set and brought various collaborators on stage. I think um, that was probably, uh, that's probably peak for me. I've been saying to a lot of people, that's quite a hard act to, uh, to follow. Were you at Glastonbury then, Kieran? Uh, I, I, was, you... yeah, I was there, Jack. Yeah, side of really? shame. Yeah, it was uh, quite a moment, I tell you, quite a moment. Um, th this question really is aimed at the aspiring lawyers. Uh, I'm sure we have a few in the audience. Uh, really, are there any beneficial skills or characteristics that suit um, practicing, obviously, media law? Um, I know you've mentioned your, your role as a sort of commercial advisor, um, but do you feel there's any skills that you've learned um, uh, through your years of, 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 of practicing? Yeah, I'd say the key skill, um, I'm sure you would share, share this view, Jack, is the ability to communicate clearly with your clients and break down um, the very complex um, and tricky business dealings that they are entering into and in particular the contracts and I think that um, communication um, is is paramount really um, I think people um, lawyers win clients um, often through their ability to um, translate essentially um, um, the you know the complex uh, issues that they're dealing with for, for their clients um, and that engenders trust um, and that engenders, um, you know, friendship and, and, and close relationships with clients that then go on to be very long-standing and mutually beneficial. Um, so I think communication probably is a very, I mean, you need your technical skills for sure. You need to understand the law. You need to know how to apply the law. Um, you need to uh, know your market. You need to know uh, the intricacies of the economics of, of your market um, and your sector. But I think more than more than just the technical know-how, you need to be able to communicate both to your clients, but also on behalf of your clients. I think you need to be able to represent your clients' interests pretty much as your client wants to be represented. So you're you're you can be often be quite chameleon-like um, in how you act as a lawyer, how you represent the client, because different clients want different approaches. So um, yeah, communication, I'd say, very important. Sort of going back to you talking about um, going to Glastonbury after working with Stormzy, I have a question. Were you a fan of Stormzy beforehand and how was it working with him? Uh, the Stormzy relationship is a, a very funny story. Um, someone had sent me um, a video of his track, uh, Know Me From, 
which was him and a bunch of his friends riding around on BMXs in a car park. And they said to me, this is the lowest um, denominator video treatment I have ever seen, but it is one of the most powerful videos I've ever witnessed. So I thought, wow, that's a compelling sell. I have to watch this. And sure enough, there was Stormzy riding around on BMXs um, in, a, uh, in a car park <laughs> with his mates um, and also involving um, you know, a great, great scenes with, um, with, his, with, his, with his mother um, and some great humor uh, in the interactions with, with, with him and his mother. Um, and I, I, I was a fan of that moment, but um, I was very busy on a deal, um, a, a particular transaction, and I didn't have the sort of bandwidth to sort of follow up on it and find out more. And then bizarrely, I got a phone call from um, his manager saying um, uh, that he had, and I was very lucky uh, with this, um, that he had been recommended me by three separate people that he'd spoken to in the music industry. So within the space of about 48 hours, I'd witnessed this very, very uh, um, brilliant piece of um, audiovisual material, and then very coincidentally been rung up by his manager. So yeah, that was that was how I started working with Stormzy. I then felt very pressured to uh, to deliver very well in the in, in the beauty parade or the pitch meeting. Um, so I worked very hard for that. Uh, I managed to secure um, his services, and about six or seven years later, we 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 have a very successful and fruitful relationship. And I would say that. He's probably one of the hardest working individuals I have ever come across in all my, all my years of working in media and entertainment. Um, he has a fantastic team around him. Um, and we always say that, um, you know, he sets the bar um, for everyone in that team and we all have to try and work as hard as he does. I can see we've got um, several very good questions on the on the Q and A, but I'd, I'd, I'd just like to wrap up my question to you, Kieran. Um, obviously, we've had uh, a global pandemic to deal with, um, and we've also had a recession. Um, given your practice in, in respect to sport and music, relies a lot on live events. Um, how has that impacted uh, your practice, and what challenges have you faced over the last uh, over a year, and how have you overcome them? Uh, it's a very good question. I mean, I would say that um, March and April of last year were for any lawyer or manager or accountant or live agent, uh, possibly the two worst months of, uh, of their career to date. Um, um, as lawyers, we don't do a huge amount of the contractual work on the, on, on the, um, in the live um, space. Um, our clients often have live music agents who represent them and book their shows and contract those shows. Uh, but the bigger the clients get, um, the more involved we do get um, involved with the likes of world tours, European tours, um, etc. So uh, when COVID hit in March, um, and then obviously the live business literally shut down over the space of um, a few weeks, um, there was a huge amount of troubleshooting work to be done. Uh, as you can imagine, there was um, two, uh, 2020 was a write off 2021 uh, became uh, very uh, competitive and congested. Um, it, it, the way that live music works is that um, half the year is tends to be booked uh, in terms of venues and and um, and equipment um, that the, in, in a year at least in advance. So half of 2021 was already booked. So everyone who was trying to move shows out of 2020 into 2021 was fighting over half a year, um, and so. What, what has happened with the uncertainty um, of the, um, the various variants and the various lockdowns um, um, is that everything has just been shifted back and shifted back again. So um, lots of clients have lost significant, amount, significant amounts of money. I mean, I have several clients who have lost um, at least seven figures in projected net profit, um, some, some eight figures um, in projected net profit from, from the lack, lack of touring. Um, but it's been very interesting because um, in, in the face of crisis, people get very innovative. Um, and so we've had the advent of live streaming and, and I'm sure um, you will be aware of it. Some of you may have even um, watched and bought tickets for live streams. Clearly not the same experience, I don't think personally for, um, for the consumer, for the, for the, for the, for the punter. Um, but um, there's been lots of that um, sort of alternative activity. Um, and that's happened very quickly. Um, and we've acted for clients um, 
uh, artist clients in doing those shows, doing those live stream shows. Um, and we've also acted for people putting those shows on. So it's been, um, it's been an interesting time because, um, as I say, people have had to um, pivot very quickly um, in the face of um, significant losses into other opportunities. And, and I'd say that other, other people have entered the space um, very cleverly as well. Brands have been very active um, in jumping into the space um, and providing uh, you know, branding and live opportunities through the digital um, platforms. So it's been, it's, been, it's been actually been very stressful, but also quite, uh, quite exciting time. Thanks, Karen. Um, I'm going to open this up to now to the, the sort of Q and A for the questions from um, our audience. Uh, and the first one I'm going to start with is is it, it seems to be someone who's clearly looking to get in the industry, uh, and has asked in terms of starting your career at a media and sports law firm, is it best to get a training contract with a commercial law firm and then apply for jobs at the specialist firms or target the media and, and sports law firms from the outset? Uh, I think this is a great question. Uh, I, I'd be intrigued, Kieran, what you think of this. Um, personally, from, from my experience, I uh, gained experience from a bigger IP firm and then decided I wanted to specialise, sort of similar to you. But what's your take on this? Um, I would say uh, give yourself a plan A and a plan B and take a double tap approach. I mean, you know, I think it, 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 um, and see what um, see where you land really I mean I don't I think one thing I would say from my career one I've, I've moved around a fair amount I've moved from industries uh, I've moved from firms um, and, and I would say to people don't be afraid um, if you have to during the course of your career make those moves whether they are you know wholesale out of one um, you know uh, out of the city into a smaller firm or from a smaller firm into a city firm um, I, I think as lawyers, we can be a bit conservative in, uh, in, our, in our judgment and our, and our decision making. And I would encourage people to be open minded and make change because I think change is, um, is good. So if you're starting a career um, uh, and you want to end up in a particular place, I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily take a linear, linear approach to it. I, I, I would be I would be open minded. Um, I think if you want to be a commercial lawyer, then obviously working in a, a firm that focuses on commercial um, industries um, is, is a way forward. Um, I think jumping out of uh, a criminal firm into a media and entertainment firm would be quite hard to pull off. Um, yeah, but don't necessarily just take a straight line approach. Agreed. Um, in terms of, the, I'm, I'm gonna ask a question now, uh, this, this theme seems to be popping up a lot on the Q&A panel and, and certainly it seems to be sort of flavor of the month. Um, and it's really the convergence of traditional media rights be it sport and music with the digital realm um, and really the question on nfts uh, obviously we've seen and that's non-fungible tokens for anyone who's thinking what what is that um, we've seen obviously the nba uh, successfully commercialize a lot of their clips um, uh, with an nft token uh, and obviously kings of leon uh, were one of the big um, bands to produce an album on nft do you have a view, Kieran, um, in terms of uh, where this is going? And do you feel this is something that will gain traction and can become a big, uh, have a big impact in, in, in your practice? Uh, it's, it's definitely something that we are looking at hugely at the moment. Um, we've had numerous approaches from various um, agencies and developers of NFTs who are um, uh, you know, out there at the moment. Um, um, trying to create opportunities uh, and very lucrative, potentially very lucrative opportunities for talent. Um, uh, I'm slightly skeptical. Um, it, it feels a bit wild west at the moment. Um, uh, there are some very serious players who know what they're doing in the market. There are also a few new late entrants to the market who are sensing opportunities. Um, I think this is, you know, this is obviously very heavily tied into blockchain technology. Um, I can't hold myself out as an expert on blockchain. Um, it's something that I'm learning about on a daily basis. I have uh, very uh, technically gifted uh, and experienced uh, digital lawyers in my team who are dealing with this um, um, of, 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 for, my, for my clients on my behalf. Um, but I think that um, limited edition um, uh, product has always had huge cachet and huge value in any market. Um, and clearly what we are talking about here is limited edition product, but it's digital product. 
Um, so I think the market will continue to grow for this, um, but I think it is a it is a very very fast developing market, and I think um, as lawyers and um, and managers and agents for talent, we have to be uh, very careful to weed out the uh, the charlatans and make sure we're dealing with the bona fide developers and people who know what they're doing because someone very soon is going to come a cropper uh, with an NFT deal. Um, I just hope uh, it's clearly not me or one of my clients. Yeah, I would agree uh, with that last uh, ending statement. Uh, I think um, we've certainly at Sheridan seen loads of um, action in respect of NFTs. Um, but I also think there's, if you're into your IP law, um, there, there's a fine line between owning the IP um, and, and being told you own the IP and actually not, not owning the IP. And as I, as I said, Kieran, I think there's going to be some people that, that, that are very successful with the NFT commercialization. Obviously, the NBA have done it extremely well. And unfortunately, there are going to be others who uh, fall off the bandwagon a bit. Um, uh, another question. Uh, how common, Kieran, is it for music and media lawyers to work on both contractual and tra transactional matters? as well as more litigious issues relating to copyright, et cetera, and other IP laws. Yes, apologies if it suddenly got very dark where I am, by the way. Sorry, my, uh, I'm, it's, it's pouring with rain outside and it's got very, very, uh, very, very gloomy. So apologies for the lighting. Um, yes, um, there are um, litigation lawyers um, and uh, IP specialist lawyers who work in uh, the music um, and sports spaces. Um, so you don't have to be exclusively a commercial lawyer to work in music or to work in um, or to work in sports. Um, and as I think I alluded to earlier, um, you know, uh, sport and music can be highly litigious areas of business. Um, so uh, yes, you can you can be both a litigator and a commercial lawyer in those lanes. Um, and often um, you find that um, litigators become commercial lawyers and sometimes commercial lawyers become litigators. Um, it's just where their practice leads them. Um, so that, yes, they, they're, they're not mutually exclusive. Thank you. Um, again, uh, I'm, I'm just, uh, we're getting loads of Q&A uh, Q questions, which is great. Um, <laughs> I've got a good one here um, and I'm putting you on the spot here a bit, Kieran. Um, but it's to do with a music uh, case. He says the Stone Roses was an important case going back to the 80s. Um, and how important was that ruling? And has it had any influence on your studies? Forgive me if you, I, I put you on the spot here. Um, um, but yeah, let, if you have any views on this, uh, let us know. Uh, I, I've got a very good anecdote about the Stone Roses case. My uncle was the lawyer who advised the Stone Roses to effectively break their contract and take their record company to court. So I have some intimate knowledge on the Stone Roses case. I actually sat in on uh, a few of the um, uh, hearing days and, and listened to some of the evidence that was given. Um, I think the Stone Roses case um, has had a massive impact um, commercially uh, as well as legally uh, on the music industry. Um, the, um, the contracts that the Stone Roses signed were for multiple albums, um, on very low royalty rates, uh, and this is all a matter of fact, so I'm not, uh, I'm not disclosing anything that's uh, confidential here, um, and for a very modest uh, or, or in, you know, in, in the marketplace uh, considered poor advances, and um, the, uh, the contract was essentially a one-sided bargain that um, uh, put the band in a very disadvantageous position, so yes, it was, um, it was, it was an unenforceable contract, and as a consequence, um, the music industry had to um, improve its contractual practices. It had to uh, be uh, much more considerate. Uh, the record companies and the publishers, that is, had to be much more respectful and considerate of the uh, the rights and the interests of artists. They had to pay them a fair advance. They had to pay them a fair royalty. Um, and they also had to ensure that the uh, exclusivity provisions of their contracts weren't so long term as to be um, uh, you know, egregious and unenforceable. Hey. Uh, sorry, I said. Yeah, uh, we're having a question here about probably from someone looking to get into media law. Um, they say, how do you ensure that your application stands out to media and sports law firms? I would say 
um, and it's hard to do this in a CV, but it's uh, but it can often be um, done in interview and it can be done um, in uh, a covering letter. Uh, is that you have to convey your your real passion for sport, your real passion for music, um, and um, and that that can be with um, you know uh, a list of. Uh, things you've done in, in, in those industry, in those industries, in those lanes. Um, but it can also be um, stories really um, about your experience of uh, being a sportsman or being a musician. Um, so I think, you know, tell some stories about uh, yourself um, and your, your love um, of music and your love of sport really. And I think that will, that will sort of grab the attention of the person who is interviewing you or considering your application. I think um, that's what I've always tried to do when uh, when I've been selling myself to an artist or selling myself to a manager. Um, I've tried to you know impress upon them that um, I, I live and breathe music and I, I and and, uh, and I and I love sport. So I think you need to do that when you're applying for a job. There's another question here about going in-house. So did you ever consider going in-house into a music organization? So they give an example of one of the major labels. Um, I have on numerous occasions been offered the chance to go into a major label or a major publisher. Um, but I think the reason I've chosen to stuck with private practice is just really the diversity of the work and the diversity of the people that you, that you work with. I think going back to my experience of leaving the city, um, I, I qualified into a, a corporate team that I was probably, if I'd stayed the course, going to work with that same team for the best part of 10 or 15 or 20 years of, of my career. I, I, I was looking at partners who had been at the firm for 20, 25 years. And I thought, oof, you know, that, that felt like an enormous long time to be working in the same environment and with the same people. Um, and I suppose um, that I've taken an equal view to um, the opportunity of working in-house. Um, the company that you work for is essentially the sole client. Um, you tend to work for different individuals and alongside different individuals within that, um, within that company, within that client. But I think private practice just has more uh, richness to it in that um, no, no deal tends to be the same um no client is ever the same um, um and and i so i think you just get um yeah there's 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 more difference day to day kieran uh, there's a good question here about uh network um obviously uh many of the talents that you act for don't just need legal advice they might need accountancy uh wealth management how do you find um, created? Do you create a network uh, within the practice you work with? Do you have um, a network of people that you refer and refer back, or uh, how, how, how do you work with the other professional services such as those? Yes, um, network is hugely important, both from uh, the perspective of putting your clients, if you're asked to, in very safe hands um, in, 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 in particular areas um of accountancy or uh, even banking um uh, but also i suppose in music and sport um it's management and agency that you're very often um asked as the lawyer to to make recommendations to um we don't uh, as lawyers um tend to get asked um to to uh, to recommend people in 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 sort of um uh, independent financial advice or or sort of investments and, and those areas. Um, but yes, a network is very important because obviously um, you're making introductions one way, but you're also getting referrals in other ways. So um, I've tended to um, take a quite sort of a, um, a, a learning by osmosis approach to building a network really, just sort of being open-minded and working with different in individuals and seeing who I work well with and who I don't work well with. Um, I haven't sort of been very, um, uh, active in sort of going out um, and sort of building a network. I've just sort of let the network grow by, um, yeah, by osmosis really has been my approach, but always open to introductions, always open to recommendations because um, you can always, um, you can always extend the network. We have a question here, I think for Kieran about someone looking is very interested in music and also um, applying for training contracts at the same time 
they ask if there's a synergy between being an artist and being a, a performing arts lawyer and if you were passionate about creating music yourself looking back would you change any of your decisions um i know lots of very good talented music lawyers who are former musicians and performers um and um uh, some successful um some less so uh, so i think being a performer um and going into music law um, is very advantageous because I think uh, it immediately gives you an ability to communicate about um, uh, the music uh, with artists, clients uh, and managers, it gives you an innate understanding of the mechanics of how music is made and, and how it's performed. Um, and I think it goes to that point I made earlier about communication. I just think it will just be uh, um, very beneficial for you in communicating with people within the industry. So I think it, it's, it's, it's very synergist and um, yeah, um, some people have used it very successfully in their careers. Personally, I played the piano very badly, so um, it's never, uh, never worked for me. Uh, I'm looking at Stuart Evans here. I, I, I could continue asking. I mean, we've got so many questions, which is absolutely brilliant. I could continue. I'm sure Asa and I could continue going, but I, I'm also conscious that we might need to wrap this up very shortly so that Kieran can get off the hot seat and enjoy <laughs> his evening. Um, uh, Stuart, are you happy for us to continue or do you want to wrap this up? No, no, I think we can go for a couple more questions if Kieran's happy. Yeah, two, yeah, three more questions. I'm fine. Do you put fine. a ceiling on three? That would be fantastic. <laughs> fantastic. Um, yeah. I, I, Kieran, I'm, I'm sure this is a question that perhaps um, people don't want to ask you directly and why don't I just ask you? Do, do hard bottles have a, a training contract application process? Do you feel, and I, I've seen some of the questions here saying whether you feel that it's an outdated process and that, that the sort of training application interview process could be improved. Uh, I guess there's two questions there. Um, hard bottle owners do have a um, training contract uh, in application and induction process. Um, do I think it's um, outdated? Um, I think I'd probably have to concede that it is, um, um, but uh, I think firms get to a particular size um, and uh, bureaucracy becomes a big issue um, and hard to avoid. Um, and, and, a, and a firm as successful as Hard Bottles uh, attracts a lot of attention and a lot of applications. Um, so it's very, uh, it's, it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to take a, a, a piece of genius thinking to um, to sort of uh, reset it um, and sort of modernize it. Um, but um, I would say to people, um, you have to go through the process uh, as you do at most, at most law firms, but use any um, levers or connections or um, uh, ins or um, favors that you can uh, use to, to, your, to your benefit. Um, I would say that uh, I got into law because I had two very successful uncles who are uh, successful practitioners in law. Um, I've, uh, I've leveraged off them, I've taken opportunities off them um, at every turn. Uh, but I would say to you, uh, it's not only about who you know, um, it's very much about what you know. Uh, who you know can often get you through the door, but it's what you know that gets you the work and gets you the deal um, and gets you the reputation. Thanks, Kieran. Um, I'm going to end it on, on, on one last question. Sorry, I'm just going through. Um, and it's to do with um, your experience. I mean, you said in, in your account that you've, you've trained at larger firms. You then moved um, more in-house, I guess, uh, working with your, I believe, uncle. Uh, and then you went back uh, to Lee and Thompson and Har Bottles. Um, have you found that working at different um, environments, different scales of law firms, city firms, niche specialist firms, what have you learned through that process? Um, uh, and um, really, how have you applied that um, to, to your practice going forward? Um, it's a good question, actually. I'd say that I've learned huge amounts at every firm I've ever worked at and mainly through uh, the type of people that populate those types of firms really. Um, I think um, 
I've learned from my city experience uh, about the sort of very professional approach, um, the very sort of rigid approach, um, very disciplined, uh, quite formal um, approach that I learned when I was uh, training in the city. Um, when I when I moved immediately out of the city into uh, a, a two partner music firm, uh, it was literally uh, from the sublime to the ridiculous, um, and things became very informal, um, but still very professional um, and um, in and very um, high level in terms of service, uh, in terms of efficiency of communication, uh, turnaround times, um, because the clients in um, music and, and entertainment and sport, you know, are very demanding, you know, they, they want their advice and they want it yesterday. Um, and then moving um, into uh, another industry, I suppose, in moving into an industry like sport, um, that was uh, quite overwhelming initially, because I, I was quite amazed at how unprofessional um, sport uh, as an industry was, you had governing bodies, um, who were pretty well run. Um, but you also had um, sports clubs, um, you know, some some of the premiership football clubs, uh, which were run in very bizarre fashions, uh, often by uh, very wealthy owners um, who had teams of advisors who were very specialist in the industries that the wealthy owner had been very successful in, but not necessarily very experienced or knowledgeable um, in running a football club. <laughs> Um, so I learned very quickly that you can have some very large institutions, uh, very successful institutions, um, but they don't necessarily, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're very well run um, or very professional. Um, and then I suppose jumping out of, um, jumping back out of sport and moving back into music, uh, music felt very professional, very well um, organized, um, both in terms of the, the sort of corporate side with the major labels and the major publishers, but also with the um, just the degree of lawyers and accountants um, um, that were operating in, in those industries versus the, um, the, you know, say the sports industries where there were less lawyers, less accountants, more agents, more managers, um, and often coaches, um, you know, um, in very strategic roles for the talent. Um, it felt like moving from sport back into music, music felt very well organized. Um, and, um, but I took um, great experience from working in sport. It made me, certainly working in football, made me a very good judge of character. There were often um, people I met and very quickly, I, uh, I was being very, uh, very careful how I was dealing with them. <laughs> great. Uh, I, I, I'm sure we're gonna wrap this up very, very shortly, but um, Kieran, I just I say it's, it's a pleasure to to find out more about your practice and, and what you've achieved, um, particularly in a role, obviously, that um, I operate in as well. Despite you being a competitor of mine, it's been a, it's been a great evening. Um, Stuart, do you, do you want to have some closing words? Uh... I mean, I just want to say thank you so much, Kieran, to, um, for coming to speak to us today. It's been so um, enlightening hearing about your career and an amazing career it has been. Um, Stuart, do you want to wrap up? I'm here now, thank you. Yeah, kind of waiting in the wings. It was so interesting, wasn't it? I'm so desperate to get into this uh, this amazingly exciting industry. I've worn I've worn the same outfits, Kieran. <laughs> we're wearing, we're back is, at school, Stuart. Back yeah, at school. Is that, is, is that an end? I don't know. I'm not sure. I think we're probably a bit too old for this now. Um, but yeah, th I mean, thank you all of you. I've, I have the unpopular job of bringing uh, the webinars to a close, but it, it's it's a really important and a pleasurable job. Um, thank you, fantastic panelists, and uh, on behalf of you, the audience, the um, the OC Law Group, uh, the President Richard Brewster, and and the OC Society. Um, Thank you to Michael Crisp too, who, who I know uh, persuaded Kieran to speak um, and speak so, so brilliantly well in giving us an insight into uh, such an interesting aspect of law. Um, you've been so successful and, 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 and so humble as well, I guess I might say as well. It's, it's been amazing to, to listen to you. Um, and, I, and I probably think the OC football veterans team are, are I've had a couple of texts asking when you're available again. Um, 
the, just thank you again to, to Ashe and Jack for being such, such wonderful hosts. Um, I know you're both busy, so thank you for giving up your time and again doing it, um, making us all feel, feel a little easy, ease and asking such great questions. Um, and Asha, good luck with your exams. I know, I know you've got those coming up as well, so I hope, hope they go really thank well. Thank you. Um, so again, um, we're really grateful and hopefully you, the three of you can join us and the rest of the audience uh, for the next law event, uh, which is on November the 24th. And uh, the group welcomes Lawrence Kirshen, uh, QC, who is an expert in uh, mediation and has, um, and has basically done this, done this on, certain, on numerous um, high profile coast cases and and numerous cases across the globe as well. So we look forward to, to listening to Lawrence as well uh, at that time. Um, but before that, if you're interested, um, we've got the, the OC uh, Hospitality Sex uh, Group is gonna speak to us about the future of food. And they're gonna speak to us about technological advances, but also the impact in terms of delivery and, and, and what the effect of the pandemic has had towards our changing food habits as well so that should be really really interesting too okay thanks everyone um have a great evening look forward to um seeing you soon either on webinar and hopefully later on in the year when we can when we can meet in person hopefully okay thanks everyone